Welcome back to the Trade Hacker Mindset Podcast. We've got a special guest with us today, Mr. Toby Mathis. Trading the markets can be difficult to master and seemingly just out of reach. Professional traders have a secret. Trading requires total mental and emotional control. It requires the Trade Hacker Mindset. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Toby. Appreciate you joining. I've been looking forward to this. In fact, the where I first heard about you and, and what you're doing is somebody in my in my community posted a video. And I think it had something to do with structuring your trading as a business or trading as a business. I can't remember the exact YouTube title of, of the video, but I watched that and then it kind of took me down a rabbit hole where I just started binging a lot of your YouTube content. So uh, kudos to you, man. There's uh, uh, good stuff on there. So I, I appreciate all the content that you put out on that topic. Everybody loves tax content. And I'm saying that completely facetiously, but I'm glad that you got into it. Once you start digging into it, it's actually pretty cool. It's uh, actually a lot of little gold nuggets, but uh, not everybody wants to play the tax game. Yeah. Well, and, and so then uh, from that point, then I, you know, I've been wanting to get my kind of my estate planning done. So I, I uh, am working with one of your advisors and got a living trust. So we literally just got the box in the mail. Now I just got to execute it and get it funded and all that fun stuff. So uh, I will say just uh, from a, from that standpoint too, it, it was a really good experience. The attorney that we worked with, her name was Rose. Uh, ah. Did a great job, and I look forward to. I'm, I'm going to be doing some. I'm kind of doing doing it in phases. My next phase will be more some corporate restructuring stuff, and then some additional kind of planning. So, anyway, kudos to you and your your model. It's it's nice. Thank you. I appreciate that, and congratulations. You did the hard part, which is pulling that trigger and getting it started. Yeah, exactly. All right, cool. Well, let's jump in. So. Really, I, I want the focus of our conversation today to be around, you know, obviously traders. Uh, you're you're going to be speaking to primarily options traders, and kind of want to talk about some of the things that that traders need to be thinking about from a planning perspective, from a tax perspective, those kind of things. Now, where where I'd like to start, and and something that I I get questions on a lot, usually around March, is what is this trader status and when does it make sense to elect that with your accountant or with the IRS? Yeah, it's one of those things that uh, came into being because somebody decided that they were going to write it on a return because there's no such thing as a trader in the code. Like you couldn't go look it up and say, oh, it's 26 USC such and such. Here's how to be a trader. Trade this many times, this many days. All this. It doesn't exist. So somebody would just start writing it down on a return. Hey, I'm a trader. And the IRS didn't know what to do with it. Uh, it would They put it on uh, just to get geeky on you. It's on your Schedule C, which is you're taking business expenses. But your income from the sale of securities is going on your Schedule D. So you're like, you'd end up with this zero income, but, but expense. And it's being used to offset your other income, but it's not really tied together. So the IRS does what the IRS usually does when they don't understand your return, which is they audit the hell out of you. And they've been doing that for decades now, just nuking, nuking traders. But uh, they did a publication. It's, uh, it, I think it's IRS topic 429. And they said, all right, here's what a trader is. And it's, it's very, very clear. And again, I'm saying that with a complete smirk on my face. It's, hey, uh, are you seeking to profit from the daily market movements? Do you have substantial activity? Hey, do you trade on a continuous and regular basis and take advantage of short-term market movements? Uh, do you rely on yourself and not on others? Then you can have some business expenses. It's just the most bizarre thing. Like you have to jump through all these hoops. And of course, none of those are numbers. So uh, in, in a nutshell, what a trader is, is somebody who's writing off business expenses called 162 expensive, ordinary necessary business expenses, but don't have any business income. Instead, they have capital gains from the sale of securities. And, uh, and if it sounds like confusing, now you take it to, you know, there's an old joke of what do you call it, an attorney with an IQ over 70 and your honor, right? So you end up taking that 
with your facts and circumstances to a, a, a tax court. And you get to argue, here's why I think I should get my business deductions. And the IRS is going to say, here's why I don't think you should get your business deductions. And boy, it is a mess. You have people who made $15 million in a year and they're like, nope, you're not, you don't get your deductions. Now, some of you guys are already going out there going, well, wait, you could always write off those expenses. I bought a computer and I bought, and I used my cell phone to get data and, uh, and I traveled to a convention. No, you can't write any of that off. You get zero deduction for any of that. If you're an investor, you get none. You get to write off your uh, margin interest expense against your income. That's it. You don't get anything else. So, you know, so when you're trying to do, run a business, it's kind of problematic when every dollar you spend isn't deductible and you end up paying tax on 100% of the revenue you generate. Um it can end up being a bad situation. But what's worse is if you know about the way the U.S. tax system works, that capital losses. So if you lose money in the stock market, you can't write it off against your W-2 income. I mean, it, you, you can to a certain extent. You get $3,000 a year. So, uh, so Steve, if you remember back in like 20 or 2002, 2003, 2008, 2019, covid you know, when we had these big drawdowns in the market and people bailed out and they would lose money, $100,000 loss, they didn't get to write that off. So they ended up with this, you know, they're going to be taking that $3,000 for how many years would that be? 33 years that hopefully they'll get to write it off over time. Otherwise, you have to have capital gain income. So, you know, again, people got more and more aggressive and they said, hey, I want not only do I want the deduction, but I want to be able to write off the loss. And there is a path to do that. So you could be a trader and then you can make something called a mark to mark election and voila, you can write off your losses as ordinary. And there's a bunch of accountants out there that are telling you this is a good idea. Of course, they're the same accountants that are defending you in front of the IRS when they audit the crap out of you because they're going to, because it doesn't make any sense. Like you're looking at this thing going, wait a second, you're taking capital losses and treating them as ordinary. Hmm. Okay. So they're going to require that you go through a gauntlet. You're going to have to qualify as a trader and you're going to have to show that you made this thing called a mark to market election, which if you don't know what that, it just means we treat everything that you own at the end of the year as though you sold it on December 31st. So you could be holding tons of equities that have lots of gain. You're going to be taxed on that. If you have loss, you're going to recognize that loss. And the idea is that, hey, I could use that that loss against my other income sources. So if you have a high W-2 or something, I'll use it against that. You know, So that's what these guys are out there pushing. Here's this great benefit. You can write off your losses from your trading activity. Then I always kind of scratch my head and say, the heck are you doing it for if you're losing money like that? Like you shouldn't be doing that, but topic for a different day, right? So it ends up being this very kind of mishmashy area. There are some golden rules. I could say, I mean, if you want me to, I could get into how to qualify as a trader. Like what are the things that would actually suggest that you would qualify? You, you tell me if you want me to dive that deep. Yeah. I think, I think for reference, it'd be helpful. So there's a ton of cases, like there's Endicott, Pope and a bunch of Chen and all these other cases that a lot of people that are in this world kind of know. And um, what we can glean is that the IRS and the courts have kind of come down to this conclusion that if your average holding period, or if your holding period on a security is more than 30 days, you're not a trader. If you are trading less than 75% of the days that the market's open, you're not a trader. And I think they're open, what, 252 days a year? Yeah. So is that 180 some days? But so I would just say round that up to 200 to give yourself some breathing room. You better be trading and you better be substantially trading. And what they say is substantially trading really is about four or five trades a day. I buy a security, that's one trade. I sell it, that's one trade, right? I buy an option or I sell an option. That's that's one trade, right? So uh, I would say that the golden rule is somewhere in that 750 to 800 trades per year. Um, it really needs to be your major source of income. Like there's some folks out there that would say, if you have a W-2 job, you're never a trader. Just not gonna happen. It's only for your account that ends up on your tax return. So if you have IRAs, 401ks, exempt accounts, you can't count it. 
So it has to be what's ending up on your return. And uh, there's just some really bizarre cases where the, it's almost like the court's looking for the reason not to allow you to have your deductions. And uh, the cases where they've kind of looks like they've condoned the taxpayer as a trader, usually they're denying them their business loss because they didn't make a timely mark to market election. So like they have all these cases where like, see the taxpayer won, but they didn't really win. They just said, okay, we'll let you win on this one, but we're, but you still lose because you, you don't get your loss. Right. Um, so there's those cases too. So at the end of the day, you kind of have some decent rules of thumbs. You got to have at least $50,000 in your account, for example, uh, or you're never going to be substantial enough. And if you follow this kind of like, a, it's, let's just say it's 800 trades a, a year, 200 days in the market where you're actively trading and you're not holding things beyond 30 days, okay, you're probably qualified. You'll get your business deductions. <laughs> Would I make that mark to market election? No. I watch too many clients have bad things happen to them at that mark to market election. I've been doing this too long where I remember Qualcomm running them at the end of one of, of one year, I think it was 99, just skyrocketed. And uh all these folks that had leaps, I remember there was one trading group and that was their that was their main stock. And uh they all had these massive amounts of of gain, and then the stock just tanked in the beginning of the following year and shot back down. And so all these guys had massive tax bills, but this you could sell the stock and it wasn't really going to cover the tax that you were obligated to pay. Because again, they treated it as though you sold it, even though you didn't. And I know some people are like, well, that's that's stupid. You that that's not a rule. It, it actually it is. And so, you know, so it ran up huge. They made a ton of money on their leaps and uh because that's what they were trading at the time. And uh then it went and uh they sell their options for what they were worth and it barely covered the tax bill. So mm -hmm. I was like, that's crazy. You lost all of your money, all of it because of that one election. And I'm like, you were take, making that election. Why? So you could write off your losses. Uh, and it never made sense to me. So I've always had kind of a, a, a visceral response when I see those folks that are out there pitching, mm -hmm. do a trader. be a mark to market. I'm like, ay, ay, ay. there's better so, ways. So if, so if you happen to, fall in that very finite area of where you qualify and you're okay with having a big, big red flag on your back for potential audits, you can <laughs> potentially go down the trader status route. That is What's my the other option for us. <laughs> uh, avoid it. Right. So what we do know is that people can set up family offices, people can set up management entities, they can manage their assets. And that that is a valid business. Like I, I use the example of uh, let's Steve. Let's say that you decided you're going to be a plumber, and uh, and you bought some wrenches and some some low cut Levi's and didn't wear a belt, right? And you decided you're going to go be a plumber. Um, the IRS lets you do that, and they're not going to mess with you if you have profit motive, unless you lose money. Like too often, they they have a a, a section uh, that's the hobby loss rule. You got to make money three out of five years, otherwise they could presume that it's a hobby, right? So that's kind of our litmus test. That's not for traders. Traders they make us run this gauntlet. So I've always looked at it and said, why would I do the one where they make me run the gauntlet? Why don't I just do the one that's really simple? Set up a business, and I could have a business that manages my other assets. So I tend to do a lot of real estate and I do a lot of securities, right? So I'm going to have two different businesses, usually LLCs that are going to hold those accounts. And I'm going to have them managed, generally speaking, the best tax advantages that are out there are through a corporation, either an S or a C corp. Uh, personally, most people that uh, if you don't have an employer or uh, even if you do, but it's, but it's part-time, you might use a C corp because you can reimburse 100% of your medical, dental, and vision expenses. When, whether you have an S or a C Corp, you can do what's called an accountable plan. You can reimburse uh, much more, like I'll use my cell phone as an example, if somebody can see this, like I'll wave a cell phone in the air. If I am a sole proprietor or if I'm an individual or if I'm a trader, I can write off my business use of my device. That's it. But if I'm an employee of an organization, the company can reimburse 100% of my expense. So if you're on both sides of that transaction, the difference is, hey, I can write off 
a third of my cell phone if I'm using it a third for business. And I have to track that, by the way. If I don't track it, I get zero deduction. But if I have an S or a C Corp, I could reimburse 100% of the cost to be buying the phone, the data. If it's, if it's used in that business and it's beneficial to the business, I can write off 100% of it. Same thing with my iPad, my computers. Let's say I like to have six screens. I've seen some of those traders. I, I know who you guys are, right? Yeah, but you got a million screens all over the place. Well, okay, so there's the data feeds. I got to write all that stuff off. I don't get to write that off if I'm an investor. I get to write it off if I'm a business. Do I want to be a trader? Not if you don't like, you know, if you don't want the bullseye, don't be a trader. If you don't like audits, don't be a trader, right? Instead, set up a business and I could set up a family office that's managing my entire portfolio and not just stocks, but it could be my real estate. It could be notes. It could be, you know, I have my Prosper account. I have my Roost stock. I got all these different accounts, whatever. I have them held inside my LLC and I have the corporation being a partner with it. So a lot of you, some folks are be like, hey, but you can't deduct management fees. Don't worry, we're not. It's going to be a, it's going to be a partner with it and it's going to make money. And it's just the difference is I can write off my expenses against the portion that's earned by the by that corporation. So if I set it up correctly, work with somebody who knows what they're doing, you're going to get lots and lots of deductions. And if it's still not enough, then you could do a guaranteed payment to partner and still take the deduction. I mean, there's there's little nuances that are there for your benefit. And all of it is, is to allow the reality, which is that you are trying to make a profit. You're trying to run your, you know, your enterprise. That's the way I look at it. I don't know too many people that are serious about trading that that aren't looking at it as an enterprise and you're making that a reality and you're just separating it out saying, Hey, you know what? The IRS gets confused when I write this thing called trader, there is no code provision on it. I'm literally writing trader on my schedule C and with no income. And you wonder why they're looking at you because they're just, they have no idea what this is. Instead, I'm going to say, Hey, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to have a partnership return that kicks down a K one to me of the net income after all the expenses. And then there's gonna be a corporation that's probably zeroing itself out like 80% of them do. And it's gonna look exactly the way the IRS is used to it saying, uh, used to seeing it. And it's just, I've been doing this again, 27 years and very, very few audits that we've seen over the years. Like, uh, like I had seven years with zero audits and we do 10,000 returns a year. Like it was statistically, really bizarre until you start diving into the the audit rates and who they actually audit. But for us, it was like, hey, we had no negative situations. Everything we've ever done has gone smooth and uh, it looks the way the IRS wants it to look. So I don't know, again, I'm, I've always been kind of scratching my head at all the folks out there that are like, you too can be a trader. <laughs> like, it's kind of like, you too can be a tax protester. Nothing's bad is gonna happen, right? It's like, don't do it, right? Bad things happen, I promise you. So so going back to uh, one, one thing you mentioned to go a little bit deeper. So you set up an LLC, limited liability company, and that's that's primarily just to keep that from a liability standpoint in that in that entity. But then you say, but then you can be taxed as an S corp or a C corp. S corp is simply, it flows through. A C corp is like a separate corporate entity from a taxation standpoint. Can you can you go a little bit deeper on the difference between those two? Yeah. So whenever you start getting into the realm of entities, just know that entity, uh, let's say I grew up in Philadelphia. And let's just say that you went to an area of Philadelphia where you had a business and somebody walked up to your business and said, you got beautiful windows. If you want to ensure that nobody ever breaks those windows, all you got to do is pay me 50 bucks a month. Right. Let's say and it's some guy named Luca. Right. You just you, you give Luca the 50 bucks. Right. Because what happens if you don't give 50 bucks to Luca? Right. The windows get broke. But you're paying for protection and I'm, I'm being kind of cheeky on this. The states offer you that same protection. They say, hey, if you want to make sure that nobody can sue you for any of your business activities and more importantly, in some states, they'll say, if you want to make it to where nobody can ever take this away from you. So for example, I use Wyoming LLCs. Nobody can take it from you. They can get a lien against it, but they can't take it. They can't sell it. They can't take it away and force the sale of your securities account. So if you got a million bucks in there and you run into a busload of nuns in your car and they sue the heck out of you, they can't take your trading account, period. 
and full end of story allows you to settle these things much more efficiently and you don't have to worry about getting shook down but you have the state that you pay for that protection and there's other reasons you do it entities don't die so from an estate planning standpoint these are great vehicles hey i got my trading account and it's you when you pass away there's gonna be an executor they're gonna liquidate your account and they're gonna distribute it that's all they can do if you have it in an LLC, it can just keep, it's not going to be forced to be liquidated. Somebody could step in there, just manage it and carry on what you were doing anyway. They also work very well with estate planning. Like you mentioned, living trust. Living trust avoids probate and it allows you to create a legacy. So if you don't want to liquidate your stuff and you want to just have it run and keep paying out your family, you can't. But you need a vehicle to hold it. And that LLC is a great vehicle. So you pay the state for these benefits that are underneath their statute. And all states have a Limited Liability Company Act now. When I first got into this, they weren't accepted in all jurisdictions. So we use limited partnerships sometimes. But they all, all 50 states will give you that LLC. But uh, that LLC isn't necessarily what we're going to classify as the court. That LLC is just a state designation. So it's it, kind of like a holding corporation? Is that how you classify it? Uh, it would actually just be an LLC and I would either make it taxed as a partnership. I would need another partner, which is where I bring a corporation in or an LLC taxed as a, as gotcha. a corporation. But uh, it kind of goes like this, that LLC, the IRS doesn't know what it is. There's no such thing as an LLC tax return. It doesn't exist. If you go and they say, Hey, what kind of tax return do I file for an LLC? The IRS is going to say, I don't know. What did you choose? If it's just you, the default is ignore it and just put it on your tax return. If you have two or more people, and an entity can be a person, then it could be a partnership or it could be a corporation. And then if it's a corporation, it could be an S corp or a C corp. So it's not uncommon to see LLCs taxed as C corps. Very common, in fact. Um, for our purposes, though, we really want to have partnership taxation for the trading. And here's why. 2017, they did away with the uh, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, did away with miscellaneous itemized deductions. It used to be that you could write off management fees and things like that. You can't do that anymore. So what we would do instead is have partners and you'd have the corporation or an LLC taxed as a corporation be your partner in this LLC. So I'd set up a trading account in an LLC. I would have a second company that is my family office, it is my management entity, and that's gonna be taxed as a corporation. It could be an LLC taxed as an S corp, LLC taxed as a C corp, it could be a C corp, it could be an S corp, but it's gonna be sitting there acting as the manager. And it's gonna own, let's say 20%. So if I make $100,000, I make 80, I'm 80%, so 80,000 flows onto my return. 20,000 flows to the corporation, but that corporation gets to write off all of its expenses, all of its ordinary necessary expenses. So now it's writing off everything associated with running that LLC, which happens to be a trading business, right? So it's going to write off cell phone. It's going to write off your six screens. It's going to write off your travel that's related to helping that LLC make money. Uh, if somebody in that business, let's say that you have children and they sit on your board, you might say, hey, you guys need to go to conferences too. You need to learn how to trade. You need to learn how to uh, do real estate investing. And, and you need to know how to do note investing. All that stuff becomes deductible to the corporation. And you don't have to have just a one trading LLC that it manages. It could be managing a real estate holding. It could be doing other business activities. It could have um, subsidiaries that are doing business activities. You could have a pizza shop and it could be managing that. You could have, uh, you know, a Turo business and you're managing that. You could have a, you mentioned Udemy earlier to me, uh, you could have your uh, education business that's running through that, that same management entity, or it could be owned by that management entity. And all we're doing is using it so that we're creating uh, a nice vessel that is a trader business by its very existence that's allowing us to get the ordinary necessary business deductions we're entitled to. That's it. It's actually really simple. It's clean because you're going to get a K-1 and K-1 is going to say, here's how much capital 
gain you had for the year on your K1 and it's going to end up going on your Schedule D and that's it, right? You're just done. Really simple or on your there's, schedule. And there's there's no games being played with with losses and things like that, right? I mean, it's just like a normal business. Just like if you did have losses, they would be capital, right? I'm not, I'm just never going to be fighting for you to write off ordinary loss if you're losing money in the stock market. I'm going to say there are going to be years where you might have loss. I get it. And you're going to carry those forward and you're just going to offset your gain in the future. But I'm not interested in trying to write those off against your W-2 more than that that $3,000 a year. I just think that it comes with too heavy a price and there's too many un unintended consequences. And there's, again, there's CPAs and tax attorneys that might differ. They have their, their views well. I just can say in my experience, having dealt with thousands of people, the harm from making that mark-to-market election tends to be much more severe. And the scrutiny that you get as a trader is much more severe. And I, I don't want my clients to go through it. And if you're showing a net loss, then you're just not following what we're teaching you to do. I mean, that's the reality. <laughs> that's the, you know what? That's the reality is you should not be investing where with the anticipation of writing off loss. I get that there's paper loss, like in real estate, love creating paper loss, but I actually have a ton of cash, right? But I'm making paper loss. In the stock market, when I see people losing money in stocks, it's devastating, you know, and I get it. You shouldn't be doing those activities. If you start having those types of losses, you shouldn't be betting that aggressively. And I, I live in Las Vegas. So I could say, I know lots of folks that bet aggressively and they end up paying the piper at some point. Gotcha. Uh, so you mentioned one thing. I want to go back to this because I think this was really fascinating. And I this is something that I picked up from one of your uh, one of your tax related YouTube videos. And that is the, the Wyoming LLC versus the entity or the LLC in your home state. Go a little bit deeper on 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 how that works and why you use Wyoming. Yeah, I mean, you have 50 states, 50 flavors of laws that you can set something up under. Generally speaking, if I'm setting up, like if I have a plumbing business, I'm in my state, right? Even if I set it up, uh, most people are used to Delaware. You could have all these publicly traded companies, right? They're almost all in, incorporated in Delaware. Why? They have a court of chancery. They have really good laws that are built around shareholders. You saw what happened with Elon Musk, right? Some people are probably scratching their heads on that going, they're protecting the shareholders, right? There's strong shareholder rights. If I'm a small company and I'm the manager, I probably don't want that. So I'm going to go to a state where I can do what I want and I'm not going to get pierced. I'm not going to have a bunch of liability to a bunch of shareholders or members. So I'm going to go to a state that's the antithesis and I could pick whatever state I want. I, Wyoming for us is just about probably the best. Uh, in our opinion, it's the best. And it protects you. Nobody can take it. You can manage it the way you see fit. You, you know, you just have a lot more flexibility as the uh, owner operator. So we use that. Now, I can have a local entity as well. I could still have that. I could, I could have two Wyoming LLCs, one that's holding my trading account, one that's a corporation. And I could register that corporation in my home state. There's, it, there's nothing wrong. It's like you can have houses in two states. So can your business. Your business could say, here's where I reside, but here's where I also spend time and and, and register. Or you could just leave it in Wyoming if, if you're doing interstate activities. Then you could run it as long as you meet the formality. There's a nexus requirement. You'd have to have an office in Wyoming, which we provide for our clients. But you're going to have a the ability to use those state laws. People always kind of wait, you can't do that. Uh, yeah, you can. It's actually really effective. And there's nothing better than when somebody, let's say you, let's say one of your kids gets into a car accident and they're looking to shake you down. There's two really powerful things about Wyoming, why I like it. Not, but the, the most important one, your name doesn't have to show up in a public record. They don't know you have an LLC. They don't know you have an LLC with a trading account with a million bucks in it sitting in an LLC. You don't have to tell them. That's not that's not relevant to whether your kid was negligent when they had a car accident, right? You're just going to tell them to fly it up a flagpole and there's, you know, there's supplemental proceedings if they want to try to collect a judgment, but you're not going to tell them that you have that money. 
And uh, something magic happens when you keep your affairs private. You tend not to get sued. And I could say this again, close to three decades with tens of thousands of clients across the country, very seldom. And uh, when you do, we get out. We just, I could give you three cases just in the last year that just pop into my head. One gal uh, in California was sued as a, they just kind of did a shotgun uh, lawsuit where they were going after everybody. And they, she was so upset when they sued her. I said, don't worry, don't worry. I said, they're, you know, Cal it was California. They just sue everybody and their mother anyway. They released her within two months. They didn't settle either. They didn't require her to pay anything. They just released her because they said, well, they they did not think of her as somebody that was collect collectible against. And the punchline was substantial assets, just nobody could see them. So I like Wyoming for that. And then even if they did get a judgment against you, they can't take your Wyoming LLC away. Like again, in California, I could foreclose on your LLC and I could sell it and distribute the assets to myself. Can't do that in Wyoming and get a lien against it. And then I could hope that you distribute monies to me sometime. What you're going to do really is you're probably going to give a K-1 every year to that person saying, hey, look, we made money. I think you should pay it. And, uh, you know, they're going to freak out for a little while. They're going to say that they that they don't have to. You're going to get letters back and forth and all that fun stuff. But uh, what ends up happening in my experience is nothing. We've never seen actually anybody actually get that charging order. And uh, we've gone, we've had $30 million claims, $40 million claims, plenty of multi-million dollar claims. Uh, really interesting case where it was siblings. I know you have a brother. One of them was our client. And one of them was a client of a local firm. It was a California liability. It was multi-million. And again, our client got out very quickly at the very beginning of the suit for next to nothing. I think it was a $25,000 peppercorn. It was multi-million. Like it was a, it was catastrophic injuries. The brother Five years of litigation and a strong seven-figure settlement that he had to that he had to pay out because they could see everything he owned. I can just go to the state. Hey, let's see what you own. Let's see who owns this business. So let's say, hey, look, this guy Steve. He owns a bunch of LLCs that it looks like they have real estate. I ran those names and I could see him on the deed. Oh my gosh, he has a substantial holdings. Don't settle with that guy. And that's literally what happened. So you're trying to. Prevent that from happening where someone targets you just because you have money and it, and it works like a charm. So, so help me understand this. So the, the whole basis of setting up an LLC is to kind of, you know, hold the liability within that entity. So, you know, let's say I have an entity and it's got my trading account. I've got an entity, I've got some real estate, mm -hmm. but it's in, it's all public information for the state that I live in. Mm -hmm. I can get your name. I hit, of. I hit, you know, I hit the, I hit somebody in my car, injuries, all that, and they they come after me. I thought the whole basis of a of an LLC was to kind of protect those little pockets of assets, so they're not part of me as a liability running around. Yeah, let me explain how it works because there's 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 two terms there. There are two uh, concepts: inside liability and outside liability. So I'm going to make you a plumber again. And I'm going to say you went into somebody's house and you screwed it up. Like you forgot to solder some pipes together. You forgot to glue them together. And it was in their wall and they flooded for five days because they had no idea. Or maybe they went on vacation and the, the pipe disconnected and shot water in the house for, for a week. And they destroyed the house. You got to, this is actually a, a real case, by the way. It's a $1.5 million liability. Uh, and they sue the heck out of the plumber. The idea with the LLC is what stays, what happens in that LLC stays in that LLC. So if you were negligent, then they can take the assets inside that LLC and take them away from you. Uh, so that's inside liability. Outside liability is you get into a car accident and let's say that you built up Steve's plumbing and it was very popular in your city and state and had 20 employees and had a million dollars sitting in it. And they sue you. And then they attach your interest in your LLC. And they say, I want his LLC. I want to own it. And your state law would say whether or not they could take it. Most states, they could take it and they could foreclose on it. And they could say, I'm going to sell his business, including all your trucks. And I'm going to liquidate your accounts so that I could pay my judgment. See, you owe me money. So if you remember OJ Simpson, he got a, uh, 
30 some million dollar judgment against him from the Goldman's, right? He had certain assets that they couldn't attach. Like they went after and they were going after all of his trophies and everything. They went after the Heisman trophy. They wanted to liquidate all that stuff and sell it. They couldn't touch his house because he had unlimited exclusion uh, in in Florida. And they couldn't touch his NFL players pension because it had statutory protections as an ERISA plan. All we're doing is going to a state that gives you protection. So when something happens to you, you get into a car accident. I just want to make sure they can't take your business away and sell it. Wyoming gives us that protection. Most states don't. There are some states, there's about 15 states that give you pretty strong protection. But the whole idea is I want to keep it private so people don't know it's there. And if they do know it's there, I want to make sure that they can't take it. And in, in, in your scenario, let's say that you have a business and you're saying, hey, everybody can look me up and they can see that, that I own this business. You may want that depending on the type of business it is. Like if I'm a doctor, I may want that. If I'm an accountant, if I'm an attorney, I may want to make sure people can see it's me. But if I have real estate, if I have stock or other things, I don't want people to be able to see that. Now, even if I am in a, let's say it's real estate and I definitely need to have a local presence, I'm not going to be able to use a Wyoming LLC to own property held in Nevada, for example. Right? I'm going to have to register it here if I am collecting rents, I'm going to have to have something here. I could set up a Nevada entity and have it owned by the Wyoming entity. And then I'm only disclosing the Wyoming entity's name. That's it. But nobody can see me on that. So they don't look at me and see the entity. They might be able to look at the property and say, hey, that's owned by an LLC that looks like it's owned by another LLC out of the state. That's okay. I don't care about that. They're not tying that to me. There's nothing that says Toby Mathis on any of that, right? There's nothing that says Steve on that. So uh, that's okay. That's so the big the big thing that I was kind of confusing was the inside liability versus the outside. If it's an outside liability, they can get in, but if it's an inside liability, they really have to stay within the parameters of the. And that's what you're paying the state for now. See, there, there are two other reasons why. Like, I like the entities because they don't die. They're perpetual. So from an estate planning standpoint, they're fabulous. If you're building an estate and you want it, like, let's say that I set that precise scenario up. I say, I have a real estate holding entity and I have a stock holding entity and it's managed by a family office. And I pass away. I set it up so that none of those go away. It just continues to operate. And if my daughter or, or my, my wife wants money out of it, they can continue to access and get profits distributed. It depends on what you draft in your living trust, for example. Hey, do we just keep running it and just give them money for health, education, maintenance, and support, or do we, or do we uh, liquidate it and distribute it? You know, everybody's different. I tend to be on the side of let it operate for the next two hundred years and continue to pet perpetuate wealth for my for my descendants. That's my personal view. Some people might say, no, I just want to give it to whomever. You know, I want to give it to my kids. And I would say, well, statistically, that's going to end poorly. Right? <laughs> it's, people don't do well when they're handed things that they didn't earn. They tend, to, they tend to blow it within four or five years. So I'm like, hey, create these vehicles. They don't die. They continue to operate. And uh, all you're doing is replacing the management. The owner, you know, still the, still the trust right? You fund that living trust, for example, it owns the LLC that owns your account. It owns your business. Something happens to you, that trustee keeps running it. Whether you're incapacitated, so you know you, you get old and you're not able to run it anymore, somebody else might run it. You pass away, they, can, can, they run it, but now they have written instructions by you as to how you want it distributed. That's it. But it's so much easier. I don't have to go to court. I don't have to go to some probate judge. So much simpler. And uh, that's why we use them. So like it, there's tax reasons, there's business reasons from a, you know, if you're dealing with commercial properties, for example, nobody's going to let you close in your personal name. Anymore. If they're, if they're loaning money as a portfolio loan, they're not going to do it to you as an individual. Sorry, they're just not. 
right? If you're dealing with a serious organization, they wanted an LLC, so they're isolating their liability. They don't want to have a deed against the property. They want to have security against the entity so that if, if you don't pay, they just take over the entity. They run it now, right? It, so, so like, there's a lot of different reasons why we use the entities. Yes, the asset protection is phenomenal. That's the, that's the number one reason a lot of people use it. Like, hey, I want to isolate liability. Uh, but there's other reasons too. Gotcha. So um, we, we, I, mean, I know we kind of touched on this with the trader status stuff, but what, what other, is there any, any other kind of points or main things that you run into with clients? You know, what, what, what can we do or not do, I guess, to avoid IRS audits? Is there any, any other main things that you can think of? Yeah, you, you look at the audit rates and uh, statistically, I can look at uh, table 17B. I think the last year that they published that one was in 2019, but it tells us what the audit rates and success rates are against different types of taxpayers. And you want to avoid anything with a more than 1% audit rate, right? The total audit rate last year, I was just looking at publication 55, which is the data book. For individuals, it was 0.2%. It's not huge. But you have groups in there where it's getting close to 1% or greater than 1%. And I would say, don't be that. Sole proprietors, last time I looked was 2.5%, right? Uh, if you're making money, making over 100,000 bucks. You're, you're talking about audit rates that are 800%, 900,000% higher than alternatives. And, I, and accountants do not look at this for some reason. And I've been dealing with this for years. 70% of businesses are still sole proprietors and they're audited. Get this. Not only do they get audited like a thousand percent more than an S corp or a partnership, but they lose those audits 94 to 95% of the time wow. for the very reason I explained with just this little cell phone, right? The cell phone, because I have to track my business use. Nobody does it. Like you're setting it up because your accountant said it's, oh, it's easy to run as a sole proprietor. You don't have nearly as many formalities. And I'm like, from a tax standpoint, it's identical compliance. You have to track your your who, what, where, when, and why. I incurred an expense. And when it's a sole proprietor, now I have to differentiate between business and personal. And it's nuts. They absolutely get torched. Like it's not, like you, it, let's just call it 95% of the time. They lose. They get hammered. They end up having to pay big tax liabilities. And I'm always kind of sitting there shaking my head. Make it look the way they want it to look. The IRS is perfectly fine. Hey, I set up a business. It's got a business credit card. It's got a business account. Pay your expenses out of that thing. Not an but, issue. So is it? do you have a rule of thumb? Like, okay, somebody, somebody comes in, they're a new trader and they, you know, they haven't consistently made money. It's no secret that a lot of traders fail and never make it, right? But is there a, is there a certain kind of rule of thumb like hey, after I've been consistently making profits for 2 years, a year, once I'm making over 50,000 a year, is there any income and or duration that makes sense before they set up a entity to use as a kind of a trading business? Yeah, it, it always depends. I, I use the is the juice worth the squeeze analogy, right? You want a return on your investment. So there are reasons why you have the entities without taxes, right? But if somebody's coming in and they're looking at it from a tax perspective and they're saying, when does it make sense? And I would say probably about ten thousand dollars a year. If you're making about ten grand and I can shelter it, because I I'll use an example. Like I'm in a home office. If I'm a sole proprietor, I can write off the, I can measure out my square footage and write off $5 per square foot per year. So this room is probably 10 by 15, right? So what is that? 150 times five, 750 bucks. Same scenario, but I, but now I'm a S corp and I'm reimbursing for an administrative office in my home. Easier test. But now I'm using a percentage of my home and I could use something called the room methodology. I could use net square footage. I could use any reasonable method. Like I don't have to play the game of the sole proprietor that's a 
that's got this really crappy home office that's on a separate page. Like you wonder why sole proprietors get audited. They have an, a form SE that says, hey, I'm self-employed. And then they have a, I uh, forget the number of it, like an 8869, I forget the number, is here's my home office. Like they're literally begging to be audited. Like you're just asking for it. Now you write trader on that puppy. And it's like, you're, you're, you're literally like asking them for a date. Like, come on over. I would love to buy a, you know, a beer. C come on over. Just, I want you to look at all my stuff, all right? That's what you're saying to the IRS when you're doing this. But the deduction is roughly five to $6,000 a year when you're using a different methodology. It's quite often like a significantly higher deduction. Plus, if I have a, a corporation, I'm entitled to have board meetings. And you could use your own house to do that. We use it, it was some provision called 288, subsection G2. They call it the Augusta rule. There's court cases on it. We've defended it twice under audit in the last 25 years, one both times. You just have to follow some rules, but you're getting free rent to your house. Like In other words, I'm paying myself for the use of my home to have a board meeting. Sounds weird, but if I could go to the Marriott down the street and rent a room, a meeting room, Instead of doing that, I could rent my own house. And it's generally speaking, it's between $750 and $1250 a month in typical places. Uh, but let's just let's just say it's $750 and you did it 10 times a year. That's that's another $7,500. Just between those two things. I've just written off more than $10,000. And then you get your health, you get your education, you get all the stuff you don't otherwise get to write off. But if I just do that every year, it should cover the cost of the, the setup and, and I get the other benefits. It should save me enough to where I'm 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 not coming out of pocket to run my business, if you know what I mean. Gotcha. So I had a, a couple of people in my community that wanted me to ask you a question. And this may be out of the uh kind of out of bounds for for what you do because obviously this is US based IRS but do you have clients who you know are US people but they live abroad and is there you know anything that they need to be aware of from that perspective that that you can share yeah so uh my business is actually owned by a, an international business Anderson uh Global is actually in the Caymans uh, and we have offices in uh, Dubai and in France, other names, uh, and uh, several other business, Singapore and uh, Switzerland and and uh, in the Caymans. Uh, and yeah, there are some definite issues when you move out of the United States. You got to understand that the United States taxes you on your worldwide income, period. If you're a citizen, you're paying tax. If you live out of the country more than 300 days, you can have an exemption for the income that you earn overseas, right? But if you're making it here in the United States as an investor, they're gonna tax it here. And then the big issue is making sure that you don't have it taxed. Let's say you live in London, you're not subjecting yourself to perhaps a double tax on that. It can be pretty nasty. So me personally, I like to isolate my income sources. I do use entities to do it. If I'm gonna make money in the US, I'm gonna make it here. I'm going to have a K-1 that comes down and I'm not going to bring it over to overseas. If I open up a brokerage account in the UK and I'm living over there, understand you are now being taxed in the UK on that money. And you may or may not be able to use tax credits under a treaty to offset the amount of tax that you owe in the United States on that same income. Generally speaking, with most European countries, we can. But there are some situations where you could have some negative tax ramifications, and uh, if you're trading directly in that in that jurisdiction, because they're they don't care where you're a citizen of, they just care where the money's made, and they're going to tax you. The U.S. is going to say we don't care where you made the money; we're taxing you because you're a U.S. citizen. I see. Gotcha. Um, okay, so next topic I want to kind of move on to. So I've so I read your book. Infinity Investing, good book by the way. I would I would really? highly suggest it. Some Thank of the you. you know it's kind of the different aspects that that it talked about was kind of the main the main focus of kind of what I mentioned to you is what I'm doing in phases. I just got a living trust done, um, but kind of the main phases that I remember from the book is tax reduction, liability reduction, income maximization, 
legacy planning and also creating your own nonprofit. I thought that <laughs> let, let, let's just let's go there first because I thought that was really interesting. Talk about creating your own nonprofit. What are the why do people do that? And and talk a little bit more about that. Exempt organizations are amazing because you don't have to pay tax on it and you can create perpetual income. People don't realize, like, just as example, Green Bay Packers, it's a nonprofit, Harvard, nonprofit, IKEA, nonprofit, Rolex, owned by nonprofit. Like there's all these businesses floating around out there. Major League Baseball, nonprofit. NFL was a nonprofit. One of our attorneys was actually involved in that transaction to, to make it private because they wanted to take the money out. So nonprofits are great. Hershey died with no kids. Uh, Hershey Foundation's worth $13 billion now. Uh, continuing to run a school, a funeral home, a cemetery, a whole bunch of stuff, a museum, uh, educates over 2,000 kids a year, all because they put it in place. And I'm always telling, uh, I, well, I hear this from my high net worth clients, right? They're always like, oh, there's, I need more tax deductions. And I'm like, the best tax deduction you can have is to be exempt. So you have a nonprofit, a 501c3. There's a ton of things you could do under these. You could do affordable housing. You could do an education company. Like you could take navigation trading tomorrow and make it into a nonprofit and never pay tax ever again on any of the, the monies that you make. And it's not owned by anybody and it never dies. It's out of your state. You don't have to worry about a state tax. There's all these really cool benefits, but invariably everybody always says, but, but I want the money. What if I, what if I need the money? And I could say like, well, if you need the money, make sure you're leaving enough outside the nonprofit to where you never have to worry, but you could absolutely run these things and they work so well with people who have more to them than just, Hey, I want to make some, some dollars. What if you want to create a legacy that helps the world or is educational, scientific, amateur sports, fill in the blank. And you say, that is something that's important to me. Oh my gosh. There are so many things we could do. Like, let me use an example of somebody who's been trading for a while. Let's say that, let's say you're Warren Buffett and you've had a whole bunch of Apple stock and you're like, God bless it. I'm going to sell it and I'm going to have to pay tax on it. If I have a nonprofit, I can donate the, the stock and I get a deduction on its fair market value as long as I've held it for at least a year. So let's say that I have Apple and it's worth, you know, just under a couple hundred bucks, right? But I paid 50 bucks for it. I get a $200 deduction. Now I sell it. I still have 200 bucks and it's in my legacy plan, right? And I'm going to use it for things that I care about. I don't have to give the money away, by the way. That's a misnomer. If you set up a public charity, you could just do whatever you want. It could just accumulate money. Look at Harvard. <laughs> Their endowment, like it's, it, it's the joke, right? They always say that, uh, oh, Harvard has an endowment. No, an endowment is attached to Harvard. The endowment is so massive. It's just, it's, they couldn't spend the money if they tried. That thing's just growing, compounding way too fast, right? But it's exempt. So it continues to do it. I just like, I just always look at these things going, if you put a plan in place and you let it run for 50 years to 100 years, you're going to get the same results as all these guys that you read about that, oh my gosh, they're worth so much. It's because they let everything compound tax free. It grows. Like if we just put it in the S&P, I forget what the 40 year stretch, I think, you, you know, 400 oh, bucks. Like 8%. Is, yeah. Yeah. Oh, 10% historical average of the S&P. Your money doubles every seven years, 7.2 years. So you let that thing grow for 50 years. You're going to have a huge chunk in there. You can still take a salary out. Like I, I, if you follow football, Nick Saban, football coach for Alabama, he works for a nonprofit. Right? Those big dollars that these guys get are from nonprofits. There's not a thing that says you can't have a large salary. It's just you can only get paid for your services, right? So it has to be reasonable salary for what you're doing. So, you know, again, in Steve, in your case, you know, I, don't, I doubt you'd ever really thought about it, but, you know, let's say that you're running navigation trading, you've been taking a salary, 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 you get to the point where you have substantial holdings individually and you say, you know what, I'd really like to, that navigation trading will never go away. I need to get it out of my estate. It's worth too much money. Maybe I maybe I, I I change it over and file an exempt status and make it a public charity. You could do that. And it could still pay you the same salary. It's just now you don't own Navigation Trading's 
stock, right? It's just now it's an exempt organization. The world owns it. Still benefiting the world, right? And you could still, you could actually have veto rights. You could bequeath those to your kids. There's all sorts of fun stuff you can do with nonprofits. And so I just use them because I tend to work with a lot of folks that are philanthropic that have done well. And they're like, hey, you know what? There's things that mean more. I call it the second mountain. There's a really great book called The Two Mountains. Uh, where, you know, your ego is that first mountain. Hey, I want to be really good in my career. I want to make a lot of money. A lot of people get over that mountain and they go into a valley because then their life has no meaning. And they're, you know, they thought that they were their, their, their job. And they're like, what, what's the second mountain? And the second mountain is being of service to others. Right. And so that's where that comes into play. If you're on that second mountain, like if you're a lot of folks, they, they have this little bit of a, I start to feel miserable. I'm rich but I start to feel miserable. We call them rich, miserable bastards. They're <laughs> just like, there's people that get that way. Right. And it's like, yeah, well, if you yeah. want to be happy, you probably haven't given away enough. Right. I don't know. Like m people say money doesn't buy happiness. Well, it's because you haven't, you haven't donated enough. You haven't given it away enough. You haven't done things that benefit other people enough because it's really tough to be miserable when you're doing something for somebody else. And that's that second mountain. And that's where those nonprofits live. And I'll give you a real life example. Um, so a few years back, I had, a, I had a buddy and he pledged his mom's house during some real estate transactions uh, in, it was 2008, and they went sideways and it took a long time for the bank to foreclose. They foreclosed on his mom's house when she's legally blind. That was her house. She'd lived in it for, I think, 30 years. So she lost the house. So he came to me and said, can you help me? And so I went and bought the house from the, the bank foreclosure, not a big deal. And I said, all right, I'll buy it. Let's just say I paid, a, it was like a hundred thousand. It wasn't a very expensive house in Florida. And uh, I was like, Hey, you know what? Uh, just, I got to charge grandma something. I'll gift her the money. Like but I, I'm going to have to impute income. I'll have depreciation that'll offset it. But right. Your mom can stay there. Let's just put it that way. But you need to do these things, pay the property taxes, make sure it's insured and things like that. I just don't want to lose a ton of money on it. And, uh, and then he kind of went AWOL. He didn't, he wasn't able to do a lot of the things. He's kind of embarrassed, all that fun stuff. And I said, you know what? It was a few years later and, uh, we'd had the, some appreciation in real estate. And I said, why don't I just donate it to one of the, one of my charities? I have a few that I sit on the board on and I have a couple that I set up. One of it's a stewardship program. It's there for, for, you know, our elder folks and, and taking care of people. So I said, this might fit the bill. So I just donated it. When I appraise that property for my donation, I get a fair market value deduction. The appraisal was $315,000 on that home. So my tax deduction was $315,000. I paid, it was actually around 90 grand, what I'd actually paid. So my tax deduction was more than what I paid for that property. That property is in my charity. I said to mom, you know, to his mom, you stay here until you can no longer stay here. This is your house. I don't have to charge you rent anymore. I don't have to worry about imputed rents and all that fun stuff. This is, as far as I'm concerned, until you can't live here anymore. You just keep me appraised. And the charity sponsors her. Um, that's what they're they're really good for. And you, you, I could charge you. You could just do, hey, I'm just going to do low low cost rents. I love working with veterans, I, you know, single moms, whatever, fill in your, your blank. What do you care about? Recovery housing, uh, assisted living, people that age out of, out of uh, state care, right? You know, they're it, all that stuff, uh, foster care, all that stuff I can do through a charitable organization. It's a charitable activity. And, uh, and it just changes your whole mindset for folks that have substantial assets. Uh, I get you. And uh, and I, I see it all the time. And they're oftentimes looking for something like that. And I and quite often that fits the bill where they're like, wait a second. You know, I mean, it's out of my estate. So I don't have to worry about the estate tax. Correct. Wait, I can get a deduction when I'm giving money to this thing. Yes. My kids can sit on the board and they can get paid a salary. Yep. How come nobody told me about this before? I said, well, they're they're kind of misunderstood. People don't realize how powerful they are. Are the is is the does that throw up red flags? I mean, what 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 use of a what abuse I should say of a charity would throw up a red flag 
to the IRS for audits or scrutiny? So this is God's honest truth. I've never had an audit of a charity. I've said over 4,000. But what would cause the IRS to look at you would be your charitable donations if they're abnormally high. So uh, I've had clients, uh, I sit on the board of a, something called King's Ransom, and I had several clients that would donate significantly more than they were able to write off. You care, What happens is if, if, if let's say I donate $100,000, but my adjusted gross income does not allow me to take that entire donation, then I would carry forward the portion that I didn't get to write off in for, for five more years. Um, in theory, that should throw off red flags, right? But I've just never had one examined. Um, I've just never seen it. And uh, one of my attorneys was an attorney with the exempt organization, Department of the IRS. So it's exempt organizations and governmental agencies uh, or government exempt and government entities section is what he worked. And he did the examinations on these. What you're usually looking at is people that do the planes in them that are definitely being kind of piggish with the charity, getting personal benefit out of it. Those folks will get scrutinized. Us, little guy, we're nowhere to be seen because we're not sitting here trying to get a big benefit out of it. We're actually doing it for the right purpose. And I've just never seen one actually had to like, we're, when when you do a charity, you're doing another step. You're doing what's called a 1023 application, which is you're telling them exactly what you're going to do, what your purpose is. Here's your business plan. Here's your finances. We're having to do that proactively when we set it up. So we're we're pretty transparent. Uh, and as a result, we just, you know, they're not messing with you. They can see your return. It's public, by the way. Like I could go pull up any charity's tax return and see what they're paying people. And I think it's because my clients... They're not taking big salaries out of it. They're using it to push money into more than anything else. Right. Um, they're doing it the right way. And, yeah, that uh, would that that was kind of what I was thinking. It seemed like the abuse would come from, let's say I have a, let's just say navigation trading. Let's say I decide to turn that tax exempt. Let's say navigation trading down the road is making a million dollars a year and I'm taking a million dollar sal salary. That That seems pretty abusive. <laughs> right. Well, you, 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 there's a real life example we could look at. Black Lives Matter. They started seeing all the real estate. They weren't spending the money on any of their charitable purposes, and so they started looking at the the main folks, and they find out that they're they're buying houses all over the place with the monies. So they weren't using the monies for their charitable purpose. That'll that'll get you looked at, and you're living in that house. Are you paying your? Are you paying fair market rent? Are you engaged in uh, conflict of interest transactions where you're deriving personal benefit? It's not you're you're not not allowed to do it. You just have to report it accurately. So, like for example, a, a priest, like ch uh, in theory, churches don't actually have to file tax returns, right? But there's something called a parsonage allowance, right? So if I can provide tax free housing for the priest. Okay, but if, if that's showing up on a tax return somewhere and it's a million dollar house, I might have something, you know, some explaining to do if it's if it's if if all the money that's being donated is going to those to something that might not be part of its charitable uh, goal. Is there a is there kind of a rule of thumb around that? Like if if a charity is if it if the entity is generating X amount of dollars, then you can't take as a salary more than 20% of that. I mean, is there any kind of reasonable? It's all reasonable. So there's no, there's no hard and fast rules, which is one of the reasons they just, there's not a ton of scrutiny on it. Um, where you do have scrutiny is private foundations where you're not doing anything. You're supposed to give away 5% of the asset every year. Then you might, if, if they're seeing really high salaries coming out of that, they're probably going to take a look at it, but I don't think it's a percentage. I just think that it's, Hey, there's really high salaries here. You know, let's take a look to see if it's reasonable. But again, it's just such a small percentage of audits. Uh, my experience is people that go the non chair that you go the charitable route. The vast majority are really good people. They're not the ones doing funky stuff, and they're not greedy. They've shown it because they're willing to let go of the uh, ownership of things for the benefit of third parties. So, is it uh, is a foundation of a very uh, 
a, a type of a charity or what's the delineation there between a foundation and a charitable organization? Yeah, the easiest way to think about it is a, a public charity gets uh, has public support of at least 30% of its monies that uh, and it's doing something that's in the realm of education, feeding, uh, scientific endeavor, amateur sports. It's doing something that's benefiting society. A private foundation is also a charitable organization. They get a slightly reduced deduction. Like if I donate cash to a public charity, I get a 60% deduction. If I donate cash to a private foundation, I get 30% of my AGI that I could offset. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, you get to write off the whole amount. It's just, I have a limit of how much of my income I can write off against. So if I make $100,000 and I donate 80 cash to a public charity, I can only write off 60 of it in the first year. I can write off 60% of my adjusted gross income. And then the, the 20,000 I wasn't able to write off, I would take the following year. You know, so that that's kind of the rule. Private foundation cut that in half. It's thirty percent and twenty percent. Thirty percent for cash, twenty percent for appreciated assets. So uh, there's a slight difference there. There's something called a private operating foundation too, which means it's 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 not a public charity, but it's doing something for the benefit of society. Then it doesn't have to give away money to another charity either. So both public charities and private operating foundations don't have to make donate and don't have to take any of their money and give it to a to any third parties the only the only category private foundations they're the only ones and they have to give five percent of their assets away every year so on january 1st you do a valuation of what the accounts are before the end of the year let's say it's worth a million bucks you got to give away fifty thousand to a qualified 501c3 so you have to go out there and give it to a church give it to red cross whatever you know you just start you see these family foundations and they're giving money away, right? But again, S&P has been growing at a little over 10% statistically, historically, and you're having to give 5% away, you're still going to compound, right? You're still going to grow over time. That money's still going to con continue to grow. And uh, that's what happens. Congress takes it up once in a while. They're like, there's billions and billions of dollars in these private foundations. Yep. Working as intended quit messing with it. And they'll be like, oh, we should tax it more. or We should require that they give more away. It's like, come on. We all know what you're doing. Stop it. Let these things work. They're they're doing a great job. It's in, you know, the vast majority of the charitable giving is out of that top 10%. Why? Because there's strong incentives for them to do it. Do you really want to take that away? And uh, again, Congress might be that stupid that they do something like that. I wouldn't put it past them, but right, not right <laughs> yeah, let's, now. Let's not put it past them. Yeah, let's not breathe that into the ether, right? Oh, boy, they'd be dumb to do that. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do it. Well, <laughs> I, uh, last thing I want to end with, Toby, this has been this has been great, is I, I think I remember, I don't know if it was on one of your videos or where I remember seeing this, but you you had some type of affiliation at one point with the with the rich dad poor dad group. Ah, Robert, so when I when I was in college, I mean that was literally my first kind of intro. When I when I was like, I'm getting ready to graduate. My mom and dad aren't taking care of me anymore. I got to figure out how to make some money, and, and I literally that was kind of the first rabbit hole I went down was the rich dad poor dad. So tell tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, we did the tax and asset protection for about 17 years with Rich Dad Organization. Uh, Robert's a great guy. Like, really, he's changed so many lives. So Rich Dad, Poor Dad, if anybody hasn't read it, I encourage you to go read it. Uh, when it came out, I think it was 1998, I bought it for all of our staff. I just dated how long I've been doing this, I think. But um, Yeah, that sounds right, because I, I graduated from college in 2000. So it would have been, yeah, right in there. Yep. Right in there. Right. So I bought it for our whole staff and said, you guys need to read this and figure out which one you are, whether you're, you know, are you an employee? Are you self-employed? Are you a business owner? Are you an investor? Which one do you want to be? Which one speaks to you? I actually bought it for my brother, who, inter interesting enough, was working at Schwab and was miserable. And uh, that was the impetus for him saying, you know what? I am. I'm going to go make video games. That's what I love to do. And my dad was like, are you an idiot? What are you doing? And uh, he still works. I think he he worked for Microsoft. He created a game called Forza, which was shipped with the, uh, he was the lead designer on Forza, I should say, uh, and did a 
grand tour with uh, Amazon, like really, really bright guy. But I always look at that going, thanks, Robert. Like you made my brother's life suck less, right? Maybe it wasn't <laughs> all that, but I, I think it had a lot to do with it. And, uh, you know, starting to realize who you are and, and what you should be doing. And it's a really great, great book. The problem with it, when you read it, it doesn't tell you what to do. So like you read it and you start to realize, oh man, everything's screwed up. Now what do I do? You know, you're just sitting there and you have the night sweats wondering what's the next step, right? I don't know if you got that out of that, but that was me. <laughs> awesome. So well, let's end here. Tell tell so Anderson Business Advisors, tell a little plug for you. Tell us a little bit more about what you guys do. I mean, I mentioned a little bit about what I've done with you so far, but but tell us kind of the whole gamut. Yeah, well, we're a one-stop shop. You got your accountants, your attorneys under one roof. We'll help you. Uh, we 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 use a real simple three-word mission: preserve, protect, prosper. Right. So we'll help you preserve your assets. Make sure you're paying the least amount of tax. Make sure that they're protected from lawyers and snoops, and uh, and allow you to actually create a legacy plan. And when I say legacy, it trips people out. Um, there's two things I'll leave you with. Number one, think 200 years from now. It'll take it away from you, right? Like if, think 100 years from now, what's your legacy? It's going to make it less about you. It's going to start being like, hey, what to, what can I create that, that carries on? Start thinking about what your legacy looks like. And then there was an old Steve Harvey video. Uh, and I encourage anybody to look. He did a master class. And he was talking about a buddy of his mom who was passing away. And she asked him, do you know your great grandfather's name? And he said, uh, you know, no, ma, I don't. And she goes, that's because he didn't leave you anything. And uh, and he's like, Steve Harvey said, he goes, from that point forward, I'm going to live like I'm leaving something to my great grandkids. Right. And that's going to be my goal. They're going to know what my name is. And uh, and I say that that's actually a, a very good goal is to say, what could I do that's going to uh, affect future generations, even though I'm not here? and uh and live your life that way and anderson we're very very good at putting all those things together yes there's tax savings yes there's asset protection planning yes there's business planning we have the accountants the cpas the eas the bookkeepers the attorneys all under one roof to help you with that but uh we we really do and when you start looking at preserving protecting and prospering we do put it all together and we do help you effectuate and create that plan uh that makes us pretty unique in that accord awesome well, that's awesome. I, uh, like I said, I had, a, I've had a very good experience with, uh, you know, setting up my trust and look forward to do some more planning with you all. So it's been great to have you on here. Good stuff. I know, uh, I know a lot of our community is going to get some good value out of just some of the topics you've covered as it relates to traders. So thank you so much for your time and, uh, appreciate it. Steve, it's been fun. Thanks again.